There aren't too many places on earth that have the snow-capped peaks of the Himalayas, the arid sands of the Thar Desert, and over 800,000 square kilometers of jungle all combined into one place. Yet, all of this can be found in India. And though India is 2.4% of the world's land area, it contains between 7 to 8% of all recorded species, including over 45,000 species of plants and 91,000 species of animals. Herds of elephants crash through the thick jungles. Indian rhinos stomp through the northern regions of Assam and Uttar Pradesh. Large venomous snakes like the king cobra slither across the forest floor. Bears, wolves and jackals roam in search of their next meal. Even packs of wild dogs like the dole call India their home. And of course, in India we find some very large cats. The Indian leopard, snow leopard and clouded leopard can all be found here as well as the last surviving population of Asiatic lions, which live in India's Gur National Park. And of course, let's not forget the real king of the jungle, Panthera tigris tigris, the Bengal tiger. Now I say Bengal tiger, but that name is not exactly 100% accurate. It was once thought that there were nine subspecies of tiger but more recent studies have determined that there are really only two. The first, the continental tiger, which would include the Bengal, Malayan, Indo-Chinese, and Amur, also called Siberian tiger, as well as the now extinct Caspian tiger, and the South China tiger, which we think is extinct in the wild. And the other subspecies is the Sunda tiger, or Panthera tigris sundaica. These are tigers found in Sumatra. The Java and Bali tigers are also Sunda tigers, or at least they were before they were driven to extinction. A lot of sources will tell you the Siberian, or Amur tiger, is the largest kind of tiger. While historically this has been true, with some of the largest tigers ever recorded being of the Amur variety, in more modern times, the average size of a Bengal tiger is actually larger than its Siberian cousin. The shift in size may be due to the fact that particularly large Amur tigers made prime targets for trophy hunters, and the bigger specimens may have been killed off, robbing the gene pool of that genetic code. Regardless, the Bengal tiger is a big cat. The shoulder height of a Bengal tiger on average is somewhere between 86 and 114 centimeters. It's usually between 160 to 196 centimeters in length, and that's without measuring the tail. And it has a weight in the range of 100 to 240 kilos. And by the way, over 70% of those 240 kilos are muscle. Tigers are strong. Even when compared to something like a lion, tigers are heavier and have a higher percentage of muscle mass. Lions having between 50 to 60% of their mass being muscle, as opposed to a tiger that has over 70%. They are also fast. In fact, the name tiger may have come from the old Persian tigra, meaning arrow, in reference to how swift it moved. In short bursts, tigers can run up to 65 kilometers an hour. They come well armed too, with a mouth filled with 30 teeth. They have the largest upper canines of any large cat, getting to lengths of two and a half to even three inches. They have a bite force of 1050 PSI, nearly twice the bite force of a lion. 
They also have formidable four inch long claws that they use to grasp and hold their prey, which includes boars, wild pigs, bears, buffalo, wild cattle, deer, antelopes, and even weak or young elephants. And although they are generally solitary hunters, tigers have been known to form small groups called an ambush to take down larger prey like an adult elephant. Add to this that tigers are capable of taking out crocodiles and leopards and we begin to realize that they can be a killing machine. So we are very fortunate that tigers don't attack humans. Except for when they do. Again, most of the remaining tigers today are living in India, what we refer to as the Bengal tiger. While the number of people in India living in urban areas has increased in the last two decades, about 67% still live in rural areas. Though tigers generally like to keep clear of humans, conflict does happen. In 2020, 31 people were killed by tigers. There are various reasons why a tiger might attack a human, but it sort of breaks down into two categories. The first is more for defense. If a tiger gets startled or feels threatened by a human, especially if it's with cubs, it may attack. There's also the possibility of mistaken identity. A farmer crouched, tending to their crops, might look like another animal to a tiger. And then there is the other reason, the more terrifying one. Every now and then, a tiger gets a taste for human flesh and begins hunting people. A man-eater. Sometimes these animals kill multiple people, dozens or more. And sometimes, a particularly cunning and vicious man-eater kills hundreds of people. One such man-eater, sometimes referred to as the Beast of Champawat, killed 436 people during the last years of the 19th century and the first years of the 20th century. This is the highest kill count of any single animal. But why did this happen? What made this tiger so hungry for human flesh? This tigress, she was a female tiger, was really a product of her environment. To understand what I mean by this, we need to go back in time and look at where she lived, the Terai. The Terai is an area in northern India and southern Nepal. The word Terai comes from the Urdu, meaning something along the lines of marsh or basin. It was a vast stretch of land that was filled with vegetation, like gigantic meters tall elephant grass, as well as wildlife, including, but not limited to, rhinos, elephants, bears, deer, and of course, tigers. And then there were the people. The Terai was inhabited by a group of people called the Taru. They were well suited to the mosquito filled marshland as they apparently developed an immunity to malaria. And they knew the Terai well, and were able to tame elephants to use as transportation, to trade, and even used by the Shah King for battle as war elephants. The Taru people and the Shah had a strong bond. The Taru could help protect Nepal from invaders who tried to enter through the Terai. At times, the Shah and the Taru would participate in Bag Shikar, or Royal Tiger Hunt used as a sacred ritual to strengthen the local alliances between the Taru and the Shah kings. Not something that would happen very often, but this was all going to change. The Shah king was overthrown in a military coup, and the Rana dynasty began, starting with Jung Badar Rana. 
He was a reformer and wanted to modernize Nepal, making it a regional superpower. To do this, he sought to make an alliance with the very people that Taru and the Shah King had fought off. Jung Bahadur Rana took a trip to London in 1850 and had a banquet with Queen Victoria and the British East India Company. The Terai, a place that once acted as a barrier to the British invasion, was no longer needed as a defence and could now be used to produce crops. This meant huge areas of forest were cleared to make more space for farmland and the Taru people. All of a sudden, these people who had spent decades collaborating with the kings in hunting, farming and resisting the British became an obstacle for the Rana vision. In 1854, just four years after the London visit, the Ranas decided to institute the Maluki Ain. Among other things, it reduced the Taru people to the inferior status of Masin Matwali, or enslaved alcohol drinkers. The Taru would struggle to hold on to land, much of which was now being converted to rice paddies. The Tarai was being rapidly converted into farmland, causing strain on the animals, especially tigers. In general, tigers don't like to be around other tigers and will usually stay out of each other's way. A Bengal tiger can have a range of up to 20 miles and are very territorial. Hard to keep this range while avoiding other tigers while your habitat is being decimated. And there was another complication the tigers had to deal with. Remember the Bagh Shikhar, the sacred tiger hunt, which was once a special occasion to strengthen the bond between the Taru and the Shah King? Well, it now became a way for the Rana to strengthen their ties with the British, and the British were eager to partake. Famously, King George V took part in a ring hunt in 1911. In 10 days, he and his party of British nobles killed four sloth bears, 18 rhinos, and 39 tigers. But going back in time, we see it wasn't just kings who were hungry for tiger hunting. In 1872, a lone colonist named Gordon Cummings killed 73 tigers. Another named William Rice shot 158 tigers. Colonel Nightingale shot 300 tigers, and a man named George Yule stopped counting after he reached 400. And those were just some of the tigers killed for sport. Tigers were considered vermin. The British East India Company thought tigers were bad for business and offered 10 rupees for any tiger killed in their province. Add to this, tiger pelt and claws could also be sold for additional money, and we see how tigers were about to be pushed to the edge. Between 1875 and 1925, over 80,000 tigers were slaughtered for a government bounty. And that doesn't include the ones that were killed and weren't reported. Tigers were being massacred, and there is something important to understand. A lot of shots were fired at tigers, but not every shot killed. Some tigers would escape into the thick bush and deep forest. This meant there were a lot more injured tigers. Tigers with bullet holes, limps, missing a tooth, unable to swipe a paw, or sick from a poison trap. Tigers that are injured like this are unable to hunt their regular prey. Combine this with the fact that their habitat is shrinking and there is even less prey to hunt anyway and you have some desperate tigers on your hands. Unable to secure its regular food source, it tries something else. Something a little easier to catch, such as livestock. Or us. Despite tiger numbers dropping drastically during the years of 1875 to 1925, the rate of tiger attacks and man-eaters spiked. The abundance of injured tigers combined with the growing scarcity of range created prime conditions for making man-eaters, and one such man-eater would later be known as the Beast 
of Champawat. Perhaps born somewhere in the jungles close to the Terai, at some point in her life, the tigress took a shot to the face that damaged her canine, making hunting and killing prey a lot more difficult. We don't know exactly who her first victim was. Perhaps her first human kill was a case of mistaken identity. Perhaps she tracked down the one who shot her, which tigers have been known to do. But, one way or another, she learned that humans were different than other animals. They didn't have the strength of an elephant, the tusks of a boar, or the speed of a deer. Humans were an ideal target, and target them she did. Moving further north through Nepal, she eventually made her home around the town of Rupal. Rupal proved to be a prime location for a man-eater. The area was surrounded by green hills and forests so the tigress could rely on the classic man-eater tactic of slipping into a village, grabbing someone, and then dragging them back into the brush so that others could not give chase to the tiger. Then, away from the rest of the people, the tiger could kill and devour its meal in peace. The people had to go outside to work on their fields, cut firewood, and tend to their animals. The tiger could strike from any direction, creeping past the tree line, grabbing someone by the neck, and bolting back into the brush before anyone could help. And she got very good at doing this. So good in fact that no hunter could capture or kill her. And when her kill count reached 200, the Nepalese army had to step in. A thousand local villagers, many of whom had lost loved ones to the man-eater, volunteered as beaters. Now beaters are people who would walk together within the arm's length, yelling and shouting and banging things together in an attempt to flush the tiger out. Behind them were the shikari, or hunters that rode on elephants, and behind them a company of Nepalese soldiers. Now they may have baited the tiger to certain spots using tied up goats and then funneled her by using the steep hills to their advantage. They chased the tiger all the way to the edge of Nepal, to the Sarda River. Many may have taken shots at the tiger, hoping to get revenge for all the people who had died. Tigers, however, are strong swimmers, and the tiger crossed the Sarda River and entered India, her new hunting ground. I want to tell you about a man named Edward James Corbett, or Jim as his friends like to call him. He was born in Uttarakhand, India, and at the time of the man-eater's killing spree, Jim was a low-level railroad employee. However, Jim had been fascinated by the forest since he was a young boy. He learned to identify the animals in the forest just by the sound alone. He spent much of his time tracking and hunting in the forest with local shikaris. He was known as one of the best shots around. Though he had not killed a tiger before, he knew the big cats well. His first encounter with one was when he was just a boy, walking alone in the forest when he noticed a large Bengal tiger staring at him from a plum bush. Though the tiger was more than capable of killing him, the big cat simply left after watching him for a while. In April of 1907, when Jim was around 32 years old, he received a visit from a deputy commissioner, Charles Henry Berthode. Berthode and Jim were friends, but this was more than just a friendly visit. Berthode had a big problem. A man-eating tiger was terrorizing eastern India, and though renowned tiger hunters had been sent to deal with the vicious feline, they had failed. Berthode had come to Jim for help. He wanted Jim to take out the man-eater. Jim Corbett accepted the challenge, but he had two conditions. One, all existing bounties on the tiger be withdrawn, and two, all the hunters and soldiers who are already in pursuit of the tiger be called in. His reasons for these conditions were first, he didn't want to be classified as being a reward hunter, only helping for the money, and second, because he didn't want to be accidentally shot by another hunter. Berthoud agreed to the conditions. A week later, word came to Jim that a woman had been killed 60 miles away in the village of Pali. Jim knew that man-eaters would only stay near the kill site for a few days, so the next morning he packed his things, and with six other men that he'd recruited from the area, he set off to try and find the tiger.
It took Jim and the men a few days to travel to Pali, and when they arrived, they entered a ghost town. The village was silent, with no one to be seen. It was customary for the headman of a village to give a welcome to new visitors. Usually the guests would be greeted with hot tea and sweets, and curious children would run up and take glances at these new strangers, but this didn't happen. Something was very off with this place. Jim and the men sat and built a fire, and slowly, over time, the villagers came out of their huts and approached them. The villagers had a look of pure terror in their eyes. It was then that they informed Jim Corbett that they hadn't left their homes in five days. Even though they were running out of food, the attack from the tiger shook them into staying inside. They knew the tiger was still in the area, as they heard her calling at night from the road just a few hundred yards away. Corbett asked them what had happened in the last attack, and they told him. A group of women, maybe 20 or so, were out collecting leaves to feed their cattle. One woman climbed a tree to gather more leaves, and on her way back down, before her feet were on solid earth, the tiger reared up on its hind legs and ripped her from the tree and took her into the forest. The other women sprinted back to the village to get help, and a group of men did try to go after the tiger. I say try because, well, it's important to note that while in the past, people in the village may have had weapons they could use to fend off tigers, they didn't have any weapons now. The colonial government didn't allow it as they were afraid of another uprising. So when the men tried to go after the tiger, they were unarmed. And when the large predator roared and charged at the men, they had no choice but to flee. Corbett wanted the villagers to bring him to the site of the attack, but they refused. It was getting dark, and Jim wasn't the first hunter who had showed up to deal with the tiger problem. Corbett didn't really know what he should do next. He had hunted before, but never a big cat like a tiger or a leopard. Even though he knew the big cats well and had encountered them in his past, hunting one, especially a man-eater, wasn't something he had experience with, and his lack of experience led him to making possibly the most foolish decision of his career. When the sun went down and everyone was safely inside, Jim went out on his own. With only his rifle in his hands, he sat against a tree facing the road where the tiger liked to dwell. He sat in the dark and waited. Tigers, like most cats, can see rather well in the dark. They have wide, rounded pupils that allow a lot of light to enter. The retina of a tiger is mainly made up of rod receptors. These are cells sensitive to low light and can pick up very slight movements. Tigers also have great hearing too, and they themselves can move almost silently on padded feet. A tiger can see in the dark about six times better than a human. Even in moonlight, the tiger had a huge advantage over Jim. As the night dragged on, every shadow must have seemed like a man-eater ready to strike. As Jim Corbett said himself, When the night wind agitated the branches and the shadows moved, I saw a dozen tigers advancing on me. When the morning came though, Corbett was unscathed. As vicious as the man-eater was, it wasn't a monster killing for sport. It was a desperate animal killing to eat. And since it had eaten already, it didn't take any interest in the man under the tree. The bold and likely foolish move from Corbett earned him some respect from the villagers, and they agreed to show him the site of the attack. The tigress would move on from this area, and Corbett would follow her to the Champawat district. When he got close, he was surrounded by a group of yelling people. Quickly, he found out that the tiger had just made a kill. Eerily similar to the case in Pali, a woman who was with other women at the time was grabbed by the tiger and taken while she was collecting firewood by a tree. Corbett went to the attack site. Among the blood from the innocent woman, he found tiger tracks. He followed them. Eventually, he came across a severed leg. Shocked by what he saw, he knelt down to examine the leg. This was another mistake though, for as he knelt, the tiger attempted to ambush him. 
Corbett managed to fire his shotgun at the tiger before it attacked and, though he missed, the loud noise of the gunshot was enough to temporarily scare it off. Corbett could tell the man-eater still had the girl as he found a trail of blood and followed it. Up and through the rocky ravine he followed. For hours he gave chase, finding more dropped remains of the girl as he went. After four hours, with the sun starting to set, he realized he had to give up and went back to the village. He needed a new plan. His efforts so far had been ineffective at best and foolish at worst. However, he had learned something. He now knew that the area the tiger was in was full of narrow, rocky ravines. If he could organize a beat, again, a loud march of people forcing the tiger in one direction, he could wait at the right spot and ambush the ambush predator, but he needed help to do it. He spoke with the local Tasseldar. A Tasseldar is a tax collector, but in this case, the Tasseldar was also a bit like the village leader. Jim told him his plan. The Tasseldar listened, and then he left, walking through the darkness back to the village. Corbett didn't know what the Tasseldar would do. The next morning, Corbett prepared himself for his own bag shikar. He didn't have many men for the beat, the six he brought with him, and a few men he met outside Champawat. The low number made sense to him. This tigress had killed so many, and it was known that angry tigers would sometimes charge at beaters, ripping them to shreds. Corbett himself said about the Tasseldar being able to gather up men that he, the Tasseldar, would have a hard time in collecting the men I had no doubt, for the fear of the man-eater had sunk deep into the countryside. He went to the tree where the girl had been taken, as this is where he agreed to meet the Tasseldar. True to his word, the Tasseldar showed up ready to fight, though he only showed up with one extra man. Corbett was surely glad for the help, if not a little disappointed. A few minutes later though, two more men showed up, and then a few more, and more and more, and they kept coming and coming, and to Corbett's shock and I imagine delight, by the time they were ready to leave, there were almost 300 men strong. The Tasseldar was a clever man, and he had spent the night telling the men of Champawat that, just this once, any and all weapons were permitted for hunting the tiger. A blind eye was turned to the weapon ban, and though many of the weapons the men brought were outdated, they were armed and they were ready. It was time to put a stop to the man-eater once and for all. Jim Corbett gathered the men around the tree and explained his plan. The men would form a line and bang, yell, fire their guns and knock over boulders. Anything to make a world-class ruckus and send the tiger out of the mouth of the gorge where Jim would be waiting. The Tasseldar also decided to join Jim at the mouth of the gorge. The large noisy group, or beat as they were called, were supposed to wait for a signal, but being a bit jumpy and nervous, they started a little too early. Corbett wasn't quite in position when he heard the beat starting. He sprinted to the closest hiding spot he could find as soon as the noise started. He hid in a patch of grass while the Tasseldar hid in a tree. He waited, and she came. The first shot came from the Tasseldar. His shotgun though, perhaps out of range, didn't meet his target and the bullet missed. It was enough to stop the tigress in her tracks though, giving Corbett an opportunity to fire. He did but he also missed. The gunshots freaked the tiger, and she turned and ran out of sight. All was lost, except the men from the beat had no idea what happened. All they heard were gunshots, and they assumed the tiger had been killed. They were so full of joy that they all let out a mighty roar of delight and fired all the remaining rounds into the air. This mighty noise shook the beast of Champawat, and she once again tried to escape through the mouth of the gorge. She ran back into Corbett's sight. He had two rounds left. He fired, he hit, but it was too far back in the tiger. She wasn't dead, but she was mad. Again, he fired, again, he hit. She was still standing, 
livid that something or someone was inflicting pain. She didn't know where James was, but she took a guess and charged into a bush, ripping it to shreds. James had no more rounds left, but the tigress was right there and still very much alive. He needed the shotgun from the Tasseldar. He yelled, but the gorge was flooded with the noise of the roaring tiger and the beat from the men. The Tasseldar yelled back, but neither man could hear the other. Corbett looked at the tigress shredding through the vegetation in a rage. It was now or never. He got out of the long grass and ran towards the Tasseldar. As he got close, the Tasseldar understood what he wanted and tossed him the shotgun. He snatched it from the air, turned, and ran towards the raging tiger. She noticed. Realizing this was the source of her pain, she charged towards him. He clutched the old gun in his hands. If the rusty weapon didn't work for any reason, he would die. She came for him, and when she was just 20 yards away, she let out a mighty roar and fired. The man-eater was dead. Upon examining the body of the tiger, Jim realized it was missing an upper and lower canine. He realized this was the reason it was driven to man-eating. Jim would go on to slay more man-eaters in his time, mostly tigers and leopards, many of them also having wounds inflicted on them by people. If you're interested in finding out more, he wrote a book about it called The Man-Eaters of Kuman. Later in his life, though, Jim became a conservationist. He realized better than anyone that though man-eaters can be scary, they are very rare, and it's not fair that the entire species be judged and punished because of the actions of a few. As he himself said, On rare occasion when driven by dire necessity, he kills a human being, or when his natural food has been ruthlessly exterminated by man. It is not fair that for these acts, a whole species should be branded as cruel and bloodthirsty. Today, there is a national park in India named after Jim. Tigers are certainly in need of protected habitat. It is estimated that tigers have lost 95% of their historic range. A hundred years ago, there were 100,000 tigers in the wild. Today, the number is less than 4,000. Every part of the tiger can be sold for money in one way or another. Their body parts are often used for medicine and folk remedies, and their skins are seen as a status symbol in some countries. We push tigers to the brink, but maybe we can pull them back. Around the world, there are people working hard to protect the tigers. Those men at the start of the video, they weren't hunters. They are rangers. They were trying to tranquilize the tiger to move her away from the local farmland. Those gunshots are being fired in the air to scare her away. The man on the elephant did receive injuries to his arm, but he did live. The forest guards in India literally have some of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Not just from the wild animals, but from poachers who threaten their lives. But they still do it as do the forest rangers in Thailand. Some even bear four inch scars on their neck from poacher bullets, but they still go out to protect the forest. And it's not only forest rangers furthering the cause. The attitudes towards protecting tigers has begun to shift. In 2006, the Dalai Lama personally called on his people to stop the trade of endangered animal pelts. Celebrities like Jackie Chan have spoken out against buying products from endangered animals. As he says in the video, when the buying stops, the killing can too. All over the world there has been a huge push to not only protect the tigers, but to increase their numbers. And all of these efforts have started to work. In five of the countries where the tiger is found, their number is beginning to increase. Now, there is still a very long way to go, but this is proof that wildlife conservation can work and we can help too. There are plenty of charities and organizations helping the tiger, and if you feel like donating, I'll leave some links in the description. 
And if you do come across Tiger products, please don't buy them. And please report them to the authorities or to Traffic, an organization fighting poachers. Tigers might be endangered right now, but maybe in the future, they don't have to be. Thanks for watching.